accountability of the New Testament. Pretty typical Christmas sermon, I'm sure. In the second, next Sunday, we'll take a look, uh, next Sunday, the Sunday after, we'll take a look at uh, some of the many quirks of Christianity, because I think Christianity is a quirky religion. And I think sometimes Christians are shy about that, and they, well, yeah, that's kind of counterintuitive, that's not, that's kind of unnatural, that really doesn't make sense. But I think it's, the things that make Christianity unique and different are really what indicate that it wasn't from human origin. This is supernatural. So that's what we're going to do uh, for part two. This is, again, not going to be your typical feel-good Christmas message, but I'll tell you what, I really feel good about it uh, because I believe this book is rock solid and we can believe what's in it. And we're going to look at some of those reasons today. And the reason we're laying the basis is so for the next few Sundays when we read from the Bible, when we read Christmas morning, we read these Bible stories, you're not going to be sitting there thinking, oh, that's nice, I hope it's true, I hope it's true. Is, is this just words from a religion 2,000 years ago? Or do we have reason to believe this? So that's why we're going to go over these things. Uh, either it's a warm, fuzzy hoax, a warm, fuzzy hoax, or you better get on your knees and repent before the living God. Those are the two options. This message is so extraordinary. So, uh, so it can change not only your life course, but your eternal destiny. Hell or heaven. So either it's a warm, fuzzy hoax, or we need to commit ourselves wholeheartedly and completely to the God of Christmas and live every moment of every day for him. Okay, part one. You didn't see this coming, probably. Uh, common challenges to the trustworthiness of the New Testament. Most Bibles published today, listen to this, do not have exactly the same content as Bibles did 500 years ago. Those Bibles, in turn, were slightly different than Bibles from 1,500 years ago, and those Bibles were already slightly different than the oldest and best manuscripts available to us today. Some words, some thoughts, and even entire passages seem to be have inserted been inserted or lost over time. So you're sitting here thinking right away, uh-oh. You can see the problem, right? The question is, if some in the last 2,000 years when you have one generation copy it and the next generation copy it and the next generation, you've had untold numbers of people copying this, and if some changes have crept in, how can you trust your Bible? And if you can't trust your Bible, how can you trust Christmas? This is a big question. This is a big question. The question now becomes if, if there can be copy error, intentional or not, some people think scribes would intentionally try to fix a passage or, or add something, then does it call into question the entire New Testament? I'm going to give you three examples that atheists and others will commonly use to refuse, refute the Bible. So if you're somebody like, like me who likes to share your faith, if you're always out there sharing your faith with people, chances are they've put this in your faith and said, well, I can't believe your Bible because of this, this, and this. One is the Trinitarian formulation found in 1 John 5, 7, and 8. Most modern translations will read like this. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three are in agreement. And we say amen, and we keep reading along with our Bible. Because, why do most modern translations say that? because we've done such great research, and this is what the oldest and best manuscripts read. However, if you have an older Bible, here's what it might read. For there are three that bear record in heaven, so that's different in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, and there are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. Uh, in the Greek, I'm told that the language here is totally different from than John used anywhere else. There are several possibilities with this discrepancy. Some militant atheists will tell you that at one point a copyist did this intentionally to improve the Bible. And you know what? That's actually possible. When it's copied that many times, somebody, said, somebody might have said, these three are in agreement. Yeah, water and blood. But wouldn't it be cool if we put the Trinity there? And maybe they did that. So maybe the atheists are right that that was inserted intentionally to improve the Bible, quote unquote, at one point. Uh, or it's also possible that a scribe wrote this as a note to themselves. We, we see these beautiful old manuscripts, and we think, 
oh, they were so meticulous and they were very careful. But we don't know that they do the equivalent of, remember to buy a loaf of bread off in the margins. They didn't have a lot of paper. They were writing on them all the time, and they would write their own notes. Well, you can see the problem right away. When Run Scribe writes his note, and he read that, the three are in agreement, the, the water, the blood, and, and he said, oh, you know, that kind of reminds me of the Trinity. He might have wrote that off the side. Well, the next scribe comes along, and he doesn't know it was that guy's personal note, and it gets included in the text itself. So something from the margin or, or a footnote actually gets included in the text uh, inadvertently. Or it could be that that is actually the original John, and it, where for whatever reason it got lost to history uh, for the most part. And someday we'll find older texts and find out that that was really actually supposed to be there. Uh, then there's the story, and I'm moving quickly, there's the story of the woman caught in adultery. Everybody knows that story. If you've ever seen a movie about Jesus Christ, it's very dramatic. A woman is caught in adultery, and all these people are, are ready to stone her, and they throw her down on the ground. They bring her to Jesus, you know, and he starts drawing in the ground. And everybody starts getting uncomfortable. We don't know what he drew. And he says, if you've cast the first stone, if you are without sin, cast the first stone. Of course, everybody drops their stones and walks away. Incredibly dramatic portion of Scripture. Everybody knows this story. The story is found in John chapter 8, begins at the end of John chapter 7. It's probably one of the best known and most loved stories of Jesus. Even non-Christians will quote the line, let he who has no sin cast the first stone. Of course, they don't understand it, but they like to use it. To, yeah. uh, Christ is the only one who could have done so, uh, and he chose not to cast the first stone. Instead, he sets her free, and then he commands her, go and sin no more. Another phrase that is just part of popular culture now. Let he who has no sin cast for a stone, go and sin no more. Everybody's heard this. Unfortunately, guess what? This story is missing from the earliest manuscripts of John. Now, some pastors won't preach it because of that. I do preach it because I think it's biblical. However, even when it's later included, it uses words that John doesn't use elsewhere, similar to the Trinitarian passage we just looked at. Most scholars, atheists, but also good, solid Bible scholars, most Bible scholars agree that John most likely didn't write that passage. But it's there in John. Why is that? Well, old texts that do include the story of the woman caught in adultery, guess what? Ancient manuscripts from 200, 300, ancient, ancient. Uh, actually, I, I might be confusing that with a different, uh, I studied quite a bit for this, but... Uh, Sometimes they place it in John chapter 7 instead of John chapter 8. And instead of the beginning, uh, it, so they place it in a different part of John. And some even put it in John chapter 21. So they had a hard time deciding where it goes in the text. And other old manuscripts of Luke sometimes contain this story in, jo in Luke chapter 21 or in Luke chapter 24. Isn't that interesting? So all the ancient Christians, and the ancient Christians spoke about this passage. Uh, it may be referenced by Papias. It's a slightly different story, but he talks about it. And he was, uh, Papias was an old pastor who met some of the disciples. It is spoken of in at least one ancient Gnostic text that I've read. So here's a cultic text, very old one, that also references the same story. It's a story that everybody knew later on. Uh, Jerome and Augustine both discuss the story. So everybody believed it was an authentic story of Jesus. Nobody knew who wrote it, and they didn't know where to put it. So it's ended up in John chapter 8. But uh, Calvin, John Calvin, said, uh, we don't know who wrote it, and it probably wasn't John. But it looks scriptural to me. It doesn't contradict anything in scripture. I see no reason why not to accept it as scripture. The ancients did. And so I'm with John Calvin. Uh, we don't know where, who wrote it. We don't know why it's in John chapter 8. But there's no reason to reject this story because everybody at the time thought this is an authentic story of Jesus. We just don't know where to, we just don't know where to place it. So it seems that, uh, yeah, that, that uh, did change. It's been changing up in the Bible, but there's no reason not to accept it. And then there's verses that make up the end of Mark. Have you ever noticed in the Bible, you get to the end of Mark, and some verses will have a whole bunch of verses at the bottom, footnoted, or they put them in italics. And if you read the small print, it says, most early documents don't have these verses. They were placed in later. 
uh, verses 9 through 20 is written differently than the rest of Mark. And again, the language in those few verses totally different than Mark uses in the rest of the document. Uh, they, and they just don't appear in the oldest manuscripts. However, the church father, Eusebius, does comment on these verses. He was born in 263. He's an old guy. Way near the beginning, he was familiar with these verses. But he says, you know what, they're not in the oldest documents. So even by his time, uh, they were already doubting the authenticity of these verses. So if you're a Christian born in the 200s or you're a Christian born in year 2000, you'd be the same in that there's a lot of doubt on the end of Mark right there. Uh, probably not the original. The old manuscripts that do mention it set it off to the side. So you're saying, my Bible sets it off to the side. Why would they do that? Guess what? Old, old Bibles from the year 300, 400. That's where I got the numbers from, from before. Sorry about that. Old, old Bibles, manuscripts of Mark also footnoted or set it off to the side or put an asterisk or a mark there saying, we really have a lot of questions about the authenticity of this work. So it's not something that just came up in the 1980s or 1990s. We know from digging up all these old scrolls that they had questions about the end of Mark uh, way early on. So if your Bible uh, does that, don't worry. You're in good company with 2,000 years of Christian Bibles who have been doing the same thing. Uh, that's the way the section has almost always been portrayed. So what do we have? This book that my soul depends on, guess what, newsflash, has not always been copied precisely. So what does that mean? What does that mean? It's, it's gone through almost 2,000 years of transmission of repeatedly again and again and again, and there are actually estimates go from 300,000 to a million textual discrepancies. Most of it in fact, the vast majority of it is grammar and spelling errors. <gasps> but if it's the Holy Word of God, wouldn't he guarantee that every single of the thousands of people who copied it would never allow a grammar error or a spelling error? Is that, is that your thought? Because that's the way the Muslims approach the Quran. They believe that God would not even allow one error. Yeah, there's a lot to say on that. Uh, this leads us to another question. Did God, ask yourself, did God have only one option available to him to preserve the integrity of the New Testament manuscripts because my soul depends on these manuscripts? Was his only option to make sure no one ever had a copy error? Or is there another option? Obviously, there is another option. And, and you'll turn on the television and or, you know, on the news channel or Discovery Channel, they'll be talking about the scriptures, and somebody will say, some supposed scholar will say, oh, it's been copied so many times, uh, we can't know that, what it really says. And then he'll tell you, usually, one of those three examples I just gave you. So you heard him in church first, if you haven't heard him before. So he'll give you those three examples. If there's no way we can have any idea what the original said, how do we know that the end of Mark is different? Isn't that interesting? How, how, how come that does, it just eludes people who start saying this? Obviously, God had another option, and even most people critical of the Bible admit as much because otherwise they can't say this has changed and that has changed and that has changed unless they're seeing it's changed verses. Getting riled up. It's changed verses. What we know is the predominant uh, uh, status of, of, these, of these texts. Think about it. If we have a pretty good idea what the original manuscripts said, how would we, uh, if we didn't have a pretty good idea what they said, how would we know that places like 1 John 5, 7 through 8, and the story of the adulterous woman in the end of Mark were different than they are now? We couldn't. We couldn't. See, the very fact that people are so confident that these passages were not originals is precisely because we are confident about what the documents actually say. That's, that's amazing. So how are we so confident about what these old documents said? Well, thank you for asking, because that's where we're going next. If, uh, if we didn't have a good idea of what, what they said, we could point out the places that have, have changed. So the fact that a few places in our Bible have a footnote saying that the word or sentence is uncertain doesn't mean we can't trust our Bibles. It actually means the opposite. It means the opposite. You have a Bible 
you don't have a bunch of scholars. Thank God for the scholars who have worked on our Bibles for us. We don't have a bunch of scholars who are sitting down saying, oh, no, end of Mark. If we let people know that, it'll blow away Christianity. We better keep it a secret. No. We have scholars who are letting us know everything. Uh, this, this phrase is, is disputed. How to translate this particular word? It's different in ancient Greek sources in different ways. We're not sure exact translation there. Uh, this verse maybe was inserted later. It seems like this stylistically, or it's not found in the older, older, uh, oldest documents. We have scholars who are telling us everything. Guess what? Your Bible is 99.99% the same as it always has been. If you take together all the passages in doubt, it amounts to about two pages. One, two. All of, look at the size of this book. The rest of it has not changed. Wow. And the stuff that's in doubt, again, uh, has nothing to do with, uh, uh, well, the, anything that's in question there is more than substantiated with the theological points elsewhere in Scripture. So it's not as if any particular doctrine hangs on, on those sections that are in doubt, unless you're uh, one of those guys that think rattlesnakes should bite you and you'll be fine. In which case, you're out of luck if we get rid of the end of Mark. So uh, let's see, where, where are we at? Yeah, we have scholars that aren't keeping deep, dark secrets. Uh, they're revealing to us. There's a great, a gr great uh, tool online called the Net Bible, and it has thousands and thousands of footnotes off the side. And each, each sentence, each phrase, it talks about where this fragment was found. It's found in Turkey. This is found in Syria. Comparing it to the other fragments, it's just beautiful. And those guys are conservative evangelical Christians to say, wow, our Bible's rock solid. The more we find, Christians are not afraid of digging up a new manuscript. <gasps> because the more we find, the more it confirms what we have. That's the beauty. That's the beauty of this book. So, if God hasn't just waved this magical wand and made sure that these tens of thousands of people that have copied the Bible again and again and again all made sure that they all did it without error, how can we have an idea what it was in the original documents? Well, there's two predominantly really, really cool ways. And if you don't think this is cool, it's because you don't understand what cool is. Uh, this is cool. This is really cool. We have vast numbers of ancient records, biblical records. Do you know that most ancient sources, we have one copy of this ancient book? Uh, we have only a few copies of, of Shakespeare. Uh, our closest connection to Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, is a stone near his birthplace. When they found that stone, they rejoiced. It was placed there to commemorate his birth. 600 years after it was supposed to happen. And that's the closest we can get to Buddha. We can get within 20 years of Christ, probably less, depending on this fragment from, of Mark. We have tens of thousands of full texts or fragments of texts, or even just small papyri. We have, we have unbelievable numbers of, of texts or portions of, of the New Testament available to us. And guess what? These, these portions of scripture we have, they come from Syria. They come from Palestine. They come from Egypt. They come from Turkey and Greece and Italy and Ethiopia, all over the place. And we compare them from different regions at different times and using different languages. The astounding thing is how identical they are. So God preserved the world, his Bible by God. Guess what? Boom, he just poured on all these fragments, and every year we find more. And they're in different languages, and here you have, it's like a tree. The original was copied here, and they're copied there, and copied there, and it's spread out. And these scholars were so careful that when you compare over here to over here, you can say, wow, look at, they're the same. And if you have, if you have a thousand documents that are, are one way, and then one has a misspelling, you can say, uh, look at, in these thousand documents, there's 10,000 errors. Yeah, because there's a sentence wrong here and a sentence wrong in this one, a word wrong here, word wrong here. But you take them all together, and it's easy to see what the original was supposed to say. You can, you can extrapolate backwards towards what the originals said. So different languages, different locations, different times, and they're almost identical. Most other famous writings of history have only one or a handful of texts. You always hear about the secret books of the Bible, right? 
a history channel or discovery channel, so the secret, the, the books of the Bible that were banned, and everybody gets excited about that, right? I just told you we had over 30,000 uh, New Testament script texts. Most Gnostic texts, these secret, so-called secret books, one. And often all we have about that particular cultic book was what was copied by Christian scholars who were debating with the ideas. So why is everybody so excited to see what the Bible really says and ignore this huge mountain of textual evidence and say, let's go, we, we found one here. I bet that's the true story of Jesus. Or to ignore this huge stream of documents that everybody at the time believed was telling the story of Jesus. Uh, uh, look, at, look at this, Caesar's Gaelic Wars. He wrote it in about 58, 50 to 58 B.C. The oldest manuscript we have of Caesar's Gaelic Wars, 850 A.D., 900 years past. 900 years. Tacitus, I quote from him sometimes, his histories, 750 years. Aristotle, the oldest manuscript we have of Aristotle was, writ was copied 1,400 years after the time Aristotle lived. And we have works about Jesus Christ, the New Testament, all written within a period of about 70 years after his death. Totally different scale. There is nothing like it in history. It's almost as if this is divine. It's almost as if God intended this to be rock solid for us to hold on and to know there is nothing else like it in history. By contrast, we have uh, fragments of copies of most of the New Testament books, again, written within a generation or two of the originals were written. We have these copies. We can date a fragment of John to within 30 years. Uh, similar close dates for all of Paul's uh, writings, and there may be a fragment of Mark that's even closer to that within 20 years, maybe 12 years of the original manuscript. The first few generations, here's a second way that we can trust this Bible. And this, you, did you, was that cool, what I just talked about? That was cool, right? Yeah? This is going to be cool too. The first few generations of pastors, right after the apostles, men who studied from the apostles themselves, they were writing letters to each other. So Paul would write this do document, the Gospels would be written, and they'd be sent out to all these churches. And then these pastors would write letters to each other and to other churches, and they would copy big chunks of Paul, big chunks of a Gospel of Matthew, big chunks of the Gospel of John. And they'd be writing these things, and they'd send them around. And we have their letters as well. And they wrote so many letters, all these early pastors. So, they quoted so extensively from the various books of the New Testament Long, they were quoting from the New Testament before the New Testament was even collected together and called the New Testament. In fact, these pastors were writing letters and quoting from the Gospels and the writings of John and Peter and Paul before the New Testament was even done being writing, being written in the 90s. Revelation was probably written in the 90s, and these guys were already writing letters to each other, quoting from it in the New Testament. Nothing else like this in history. These first few generations of pastors quoted from the New Testament, almost the entire New Testament uh, manuscript so frequently and extensively that if we didn't have those 30,000 documents I told you about, remember 30,000 documents? If we didn't have those, we could just collect the letters of these pastors from the first few generations and we could reconstruct almost the entire New Testament from their quotes. That is stunning. That is mind-blowing. And there's nothing else like it in history. This Bible is rock solid. And so when it says that God came down to die for our sins, and we knew him, and we met him, and he was the word, and the word was whistless, and the word was, you know, the, the, was dwelt among us as flesh, we can trust this. These are what the eyewitnesses said and experienced. So that's why sometimes modern translations will set a verse or a passage aside or place it as a footnote and tell us that some ancient texts are different because we have a mountain of ancient material to work with and we can compare it together and we can say, oh yeah, that is a little different here than over here. In fact, that stream is different, but you have these other streams here that are all the same. We're going to say that about right here in history, that idea came in because before that it's not existent, after that it is. See, see how you can get together and say what the originals probably said. And even, again, even the atheist on television who's saying we can't trust the Bible, because look at how Mark changed. 
he's tacitly admitting that we can know what the original said, otherwise he couldn't know it changed. This book, trust it. There's nothing else like it in the world. Amazing thing, uh, the amazing thing to me is not that there's a few scribal insertions here, and they could have been, again, intentional, because he's writing off the side some notes to himself, or it could have been some guy saying, oh, I don't think the Bible explained it well enough. I'm going to improve it a little bit. You know, that's not good, but it could be. Most of it is error. Again, most of it is uh, grammar and uh, punctuation. The amazing thing is not that a few scribes made some errors here over the thousands of years of copying and recopying and recopying and recopying and recopying. The amazing thing is you get them from different regions, in different languages, at different times, and they match up. That's the amazing part of our scripture. This book is rock solid, and it's not just amazing in the fact that it hasn't changed. It's amazing in what it can do for your life and in my life to know with certainty that God loves you. God cares about you. At Christmas time is when God says, I see the pain in the world. I see how you're messed up, and I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to come down alongside you and be with you. And trust me, everything is going to be okay. We can trust this book because we can trust the author of this book. And that means, hallelujah, we can trust Christmas. And you don't have to worry that it's just a, a nice, cute little fairy tale. You don't have to worry that it's, it's just a lot of make-believe. Okay, that, that stuff over there, that's fun. That's okay. But the truth of Christmas, the, the core of Christmas is true. It's true. And it makes all the difference in the world. And God loves you, and heaven's doors are wide open, and everyone in this room can have eternity with the Lord and share in this fellowship. We would only humble ourselves, repent of our sins, say, okay, God, I'm not going to fight with you. I want to be part of this. I want to be part of your family. Amen. And we sign up, and he says, okay, I've been waiting. Here we go. We can trust Christmas. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, oh, Father, uh, some difficult things we studied this morning, but I, I hope, Lord, that you help us to cement this idea in that it's not just uh, warm wishes, it's not just fuzzy thinking, Lord, but we're, we're putting our faith in a book that has changed lives in countless cultures across the globe, that has, has altered, driven people to their knees in repentance, Lord, and altered people's hopes and dreams and perspectives from uh, every race and every uh, social level, every, every level of education, Father. Lord, uh, no matter where this message goes, it impacts people. And Father, we just took a look at the history of how you preserved it, Lord, and we, we stand before you humbled and amazed at, at how solid this book is and the way you've de decided to keep it uh, for us, Father. Lord, help us to embrace this story, the, the true message of Christmas. And Father, as you came to give yourself, give yourself for us, I pray that we will give ourselves back to you and to each other, Lord, that we will understand true love means self-sacrifice and giving. And Lord, that the patience you have for us, we'd be patient with other people, Lord, and that the hope and the, the joy that you give us, Lord, and the love that we would turn around and extend hope and joy and love and forgiveness to everyone else around us, Father, that you could actually take a hold of a cynical, sarcastic, messed up world, Lord God, and teach us that love is real, that you're real, and that things can be different when we come to you. Lord, thank you for being so good, and thank you, God, for Christmas. Help us to celebrate it. Help us celebrate real Christmas this year. Pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Jamesville Athletic Club.